Can giving felons a second chance give Republicans a better chance at the White House? That question is part of Senator Rand Paul's latest effort to reach out to minority voters and perhaps even expand the number of those voters. Senator Paul will introduce legislation this week that he claims could help as many as one million nonviolent felons gain access to the voting booth once again. Having previously compared federal drug laws to the racist policies of Jim Crow, Paul took on his fellow Republicans yesterday on Meet the Press, saying they need to line up to their so-called, live up to their so-called family values. And whose brother, 30 years ago, grew marijuana plants in college. He made a mistake. He probably would tell you now it's a mistake. He still can't vote. And every time he goes to get a job, he has to check a box that says convicted felon. If we're the party of family values and keeping families together and a party that believes in redemption and second chances, we should be for letting people have the right to vote back. And maybe, just maybe, helping Republicans redeem themselves among minority voters in the process. The face of the Republican Party needs to be not about suppressing vote, but about enhancing the vote. Enhancing the vote, says the man who desperately wants to be the face of the Republican Party come 2016. Joining me now is the Truman Capote Fellow at Yale Law School, Emily Bazelon, and staff writer for Slate, Jamel Bowie. Jamel, let me start with you. Enhanced voting, which is, wow, that's a creative term if ever I have heard one. My question <laughs> to you is, can Rand Paul get away with pushing more sort of equitable voting policy at the same time that the rest of his party is literally trying to disenfranchise hundreds of thousands, if not millions of voters in this country. I think he can definitely do it, right? Like there's nothing stopping him from making this appeal and I hope he continues to make this appeal. I've written before about sort of the really terrible effect that felon disenfranchisement laws have on communities, on individuals, and I'm, I'm glad to see Paul sort of take up this cause, because it really is a disgrace that we have over, you know, close to six million Americans who can't vote because of prior convictions and felonies. Um, with that said, he, for this to really be something that helps the Republican Party and not just makes Rand Paul look like a good dude, um, he <laughs> has to have other Republicans on his side joining with him. And while here and there there have been, I know in my home state of Virginia, uh, former Governor Bob McDonnell was sort of on, on the forefront of uh, helping felons get their voting rights back in the state. You know, across the South and in other areas, Republicans have gone in the opposite direction, making it tougher for former felons to get their rights to vote back. To say nothing about, to say, to say nothing of voter ID laws and everything like that, which um, plenty of evidence is accumulating to show has a substantially uh, negative effect on minority voters. Jamel, we are going to return to the question of Rand Paul's good dudery, but first, <laughs> Emily, in terms of actually reforming our prison system, I mean, you look at the numbers numbers in terms of felons who are not allowed to vote. I mean, nearly 8% of America's uh, black population currently cannot vote. In 2010, almost half of the sentenced federal prisoners, 48%, were held for drug crimes, while only 8% were held for violent offenses. Where are the courts on this issue, in your expert opinion? The courts are, I think, to a large degree, waiting for Congress. Um, waiting for Congress and the president to lift mandatory minimum sentences that keep people in prison for long periods, and waiting for other kinds of reforms that would really allow for a change in our mass incarceration policies. Jamel, um, we're, we're, we're obviously flipping back and forth here between the politics and the court side, but to go back to the politics for a moment, um, when we talk about the Republican Party writ large, that we talk a lot about the intra-party warfare and the struggle with, between various factions of the party, Rand Paul, as you point out, is, I think, forthrightly trying to ameliorate some of the bad parts of the party, or at least have a bigger, broader, more inclusive message. He's the guy that went to Howard University. He's trying to change the so-called face of the Republican Party. But my question to you is, you know, does this get him and does does all, I mean, every time he does one of these things, whether which is to say outreach to a black community or talking to black people in a way that is more substantive and direct, perhaps, than some of his other uh, party colleagues, it sometimes works for him and sometimes totally blows up in his face. And, <laughs> and, and to, I mean, I, I don't want to invoke the phrase no good deed goes unpunished because there is a, you know, partisan political calculation here. Where do you think he is in terms of just trying? Does that help? Again, I think it helps for Rand Paul, and um, that's no small thing. I mean, if, let's say, Rand Paul in his reelection election race um, 
I guess that would be in 2016, ends up, and he, let's say he's not the president of the United States. So he's running just for re-election and he ends up um, getting a larger portion of the black vote than he did before. That shows that there is a payoff to doing this, however small. Um, and if Rand Paul can build esteem with African American voters as an individual lawmaker, I think it sends a good signal to other Republicans. But sort of the, the unfortunate fact is that too much of the Republican Party has made this really, I think, poor uh, strategic and tactical decision, but certainly um, explicit decision to look for votes other than the African American and even the Latino community to, tr sort, to sort of drive up their vote share among white voters. And so they've, they've, turn, they've turned away from um, these sort of substantive minority appeals. Certainly you have plenty of folks visiting inner cities and saying the right words here and there. I mean, Paul Ryan um, has been doing that for the last two years, but yeah. it hasn't really come coupled with a substantive agenda. Um, and Rand Paul seems to be the only person doing that in the National Republican Party. Uh, and, you know, again, it may, it may rebound to his benefit, but it might be one of those very isolated circumstances. Well, but Emily, you know, if Rand Paul is talking about uh, Senate giving felons the right to vote, Chris Christie has also taken up the the war on the war on drugs, if you can call it that. And this weekend at the Faith and Freedom Coalition said that you know the, he's in his own state of his own state of New Jersey, he's pushing to change the drug laws to emphasize treatment for addiction rather than punitive jail sentences. It feels like, broadly speaking, both legislatively and in terms of the judicial branch. There's a real movement to reform the way we prosecute and deal with drugs and, and offenders in, in, in uh, drug, drug, drug crimes. Well, there's certainly more bipartisan recognition that we've gone too far on mass incarceration. And frankly, this is a matter of money. We're just spending such an enormous amount of money on the prison population that politicians in both parties are ready to pull back. That said, the sentencing reform package that Attorney General Eric Holder backs and that has had some bipartisan support seems to be dying in Congress this year. And I want to give Rand Paul some credit with this um, felon disenfranchisement move for doing something that might really be against the political interests of the Republican Party. Because if his bill were to become law and these people started voting, they would mostly be voting for Democrats. So maybe, as Jamel said, he gets a little bit of credit for mo with moderate swing voters. But think about Florida, 1.3 million disenfranchised voters in Florida, more than one in five of the adult black population. Those people vote. They could swing a presidential election. Indeed they could, especially in the state of Florida. Emily Bazelon and Jamel Bowie, thank you guys both for your time.